Good morning, church. I want to invite you to come have a seat as we get started this morning. And a wonderful evening of rain, so we should have nice green grass this morning. What a beautiful day today. If you're new here this morning, we're so glad you came. There's a gift for you in the welcome booth in the foyer. I want to encourage you to stop by there and avail yourself of that. But we're just really glad you're here. And I want to announce a few things that are going on. In the past few weeks, two new Sunday school classes have begun. The book of Hebrews is being taught by Gary Beers in room 106. That's downstairs across from the bathrooms for young adults. Um, and, and we have two groups for young adults. We have this Sunday school class, and we have a Tuesday night growth group for young adults. And so uh, just want to encourage you with those things. If you know someone um, who is in that category, to let them know about those things. Um, it's really important that people uh, are able to find others that are similar in their age and going through times of life as they pursue Christ. Also, Freddie Harris is teaching through Philippians in Romans 1 through 8. As a kid, I used to think that Philippians was written to the Filipinos. I almost hate to admit that, but I always thought, boy, how did Paul get to the Philippines? This is amazing. He really got around. But no, uh, <laughs> it's about the book of Philippians from Europe. So um, that's a great study. I want to encourage you. They have, they have room for you. And so uh, that would be a great place to visit. Well, we're still doing VBS this month, and though we had our first one this last Wednesday, they're, go they're continuing. I think we have about three more. Uh, it's called The Great Jungle Journey. This is from Answers in Genesis. It's every Wednesday night uh, in May from 6.20 to 8 p.m. Parents and grandparents, it's not too late to register your kids at the kid men table downstairs and help your child climb aboard for an epic cruise from Genesis to Revelation. There is no charge, but helpers are still needed. Please contact Megan Conant, our children's ministry director, for details. Men, next Saturday is, there we go, men's breakfast. But what's on that picture is not what's on the menu. This May is our steak breakfast. So, yes, ooh. The steaks have been purchased. We will be barbecuing. Uh, and we'll have a great time. Matt Nevers will be speaking on the topic of living authentically as we're going through this year about um, how to be a man of God in our families and in our church. Um, we're really focusing in on the basics of what it means to be a Christian man. So I want to invite you to our men's breakfast on Saturday. We're also doing a fundraiser for the Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center with baby bottles. Um, so we are big supporters of the Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center. Um, this is an amazing work, saving lives, and um, simply take a bottle, fill it with your loose change, and turn it back into the church. Uh, it's, it doesn't get easier to save lives. And so uh, please go ahead and grab those. We re return those bottles by Father's Day, June 16th. Speaking of babies, we'd like to welcome two new additions to our church family. We have Jethro Robert Raymond Finch, born March 17th, to Damon and Hannah Finch. And then Vivian June Ashley was born April 8th to Luke and Devin Ashley. So the church is growing. This is wonderful. Well, um, also want to let you know that we are having our annual Memorial Day church picnic coming up uh, the, the weekend of Memorial Day. Uh, and so this is May 26. We'll be meeting outside. Uh, we started this during COVID where we loved meeting outside so much. We used to do this on another day, but now we do our whole church service outside at 10 a.m. Uh, yes, the sprinklers will be turned off. <laughs> And uh, we usually help, it's kind of a potluck, so we provide the meat, and if you guys can provide uh, the sides, salads, chips, and desserts, uh, we have sign-up sheets in the uh, welcome booth, and then also there's a place you can sign up online at perfectpotluck.com, and uh, the coordinator's last name is Nevers, and the password is CFBC. 
So um, those are two ways to sign up for those things. It's a great barbecue. Uh, we sing outside. We, 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 you know, we worship in every way outside. And then we have all kinds of games. And uh, this year, my big push is I said, we need to get a pickleball court going out here in the uh, parking lot. So um, you pickleballers um, can start warming up. Well, there's a lot more information. Please read your bulletin. And there are offering boxes in the foyer for your gifts. And now we have a video a special message from Women's Ministries. Join us at this year's Women's Retreat where we get to explore and experience the meaning of Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Women's Retreat is, is a wonderful time to just give up those daily chores and come on up and have a great time and get to know other women in the church and or other churches, just fellowship with other Christian women and uh, enjoy God's Word. Last year at Women's Retreat, I think I'd only been going to the church like two weeks or something like that. And when I went there, I made a lot of acquaintances and a lot of friends that over the past year have become like family to me. At each chapel session, we will hear powerful teaching from our own award-winning keynote speaker, Joan Endicott, listen to heartfelt testimonies, worship with live music, and engage in prayer in small groups. In all these, we strive to provide a spiritually enriching and reinvigorating environment for our women. The prayer groups last year were, were so helpful with um, getting to come together with, again, women that I, I haven't really spoken to very frequently and to be able to love on each other with prayer um, and encourage each other in the areas that we struggle with, it was, it was really encouraging. Hey Overcomer, it's Joan Endicott, and I'm so excited that we get to be together soon, diving deep into God's Word and what He says about you. If you've got a study Bible, I'd love you to bring it because it just allows you to go even deeper. Listen, if you've ever felt inadequate, inferior, or insecure, I totally get it. So we're just going to look at those fears that we sometimes hang on to and break the chains that bind us in, and go into what God's truth is. And in that truth is where we are set free. I'm so excited to see you then. God bless. Our desire is for every participant to leave the retreat feeling a deeper connection with our Lord and King Jesus Christ, fostering a sense of fearlessness as we lean on His strength and unite in fellowship with fellow believers. In fellowship, we grow, support, and uplift one another. Whether it's through shared meals, games, hikes, creative activities, or leisurely outings, we come together to praise, worship, and strengthen our bonds. This year, we extend a warm invitation to all women from our Caldwell First Baptist community, along with several neighboring churches, embracing this opportunity for outreach and broader fellowship. So get out there and register today. Secure your spot now. You can put a down payment, pay in full. If you need scholarships, please let someone know. Um, the retreat will be held at the Quaker Hill Conference Center in McCall, Idaho, and it is May 17th, 18th, and 19th. And gentlemen, remember, Mother's Day is May 12th. This could be a wonderful gift. Hint, hint. We look forward to what God can do in retreats such as that and be praying for them that God really um, ministers to every heart that's there. Let's pray together and seek the Lord's face. And one of our verses today has to do with this theme of faith over fear. And it says this, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. So let's pray to the Lord and ask him to guide us today out of fear. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a Father who loves us, who guides us, who cares for us. You're a good, good Father. And Lord, we need a good Father. And so I pray that we would embrace you 
um, not as someone to live uh, afraid of, but Lord, one who is close, one who is a close shepherd, who is always monitoring and caring for and, and leading his sheep. Lord, you, you, there's no need that it goes un, unnoticed by you. There is nothing that we're dealing with that you don't see and care about. And Lord, we don't have a spirit of fear. Uh, you did not give us that if we have it. Lord, you want to drive it out. You have given us the spirit of adoption as your kids. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us today to embrace the place we have in your kingdom as your sons. Lord, I pray that we would truly find joy in your family, that, that we have this wonderful spiritual family where you are our father and we are surrounded by our brothers and sisters. And so, Lord, I thank you so much. And I thank you ultimately that we have this through our brother Christ, that Christ has brought us into the family and that we can enjoy all of these relationships. Lord, I pray that you would help us to um, put to death the sin that so immediately tries to get us to live against the family lifestyle. And I pray, Lord, that we would identify with who we are in Jesus so that we may live according to Christ. Because we are crucified with Christ and we no longer live. But the life we live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave his life for us. And all God's people said, amen. Would you please stand with me as we read God's word together? It's a new verse of the month. Ezekiel 36, this is the promise of the new covenant. Ezekiel 36 describes the new covenant, and today is Communion Sunday where we uh, celebrate the new covenant that we're in, and so let's go ahead and read together. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Ezekiel 36, 27. And how wonderful that we have the spirit as our guide in life. Would you greet some brothers and sisters around you? So I was just instructed to rein you in. So if you guys could all make your way back to your seats.
You have just experienced, and hopefully you experience this a lot, you have just experienced the beauty of Christian fellowship. And it's pretty awesome, right? To be able to have fellowship with each other. But here's something that's amazing too. Think about this. The fact that we have been called into sweet fellowship with the God and creator of the universe, the one who spoke and everything that we know and see leapt into existence at his very word. And we have opportunity to have sweet fellowship with him uh, because of what Jesus has done for us. So let's all uh, stand. And I don't know if you guys, do you guys ever think about this too? What an amazing privilege it is to be able to gather together in the name of Jesus. Like there's a lot of places that don't get to do this. And we have this amazing privilege that we get to do this and we get to lift, <laughs> we get to lift our voices to the King of Kings and, sh and express to him our gratitude for everything that he's done for us. So we have the amazing joy of doing that right now. Father, thank you so much for your perfect plan for the salvation of mankind. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for, for working out that plan and sacrificing yourself on our behalf that we might not experience eternal separation from you, but that we might have the sweet fellowship that begins now at the, at the moment of justification, at the moment of salvation, then it extends into eternity. Thank you for that gift. Holy Spirit, thank you for the work that you do inside of us to teach us, um, to grow us, and most importantly, to mold us into the image of our Lord Jesus. We praise you, triune God, for your amazing work for the salvation of mankind, that you loved us so much that you, de that you determined not to leave us where we were in our lost state, but you came up with the plan and worked the plan to save each one of us. Thank you for that, Lord. I pray that our sanctification continues through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
seated. Children have now been dismissed for Children's Church and want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Our reading today is a short one, verses 12 through 17, but oh, how powerful these verses are. I want to encourage you just as you hear these things to let the fatherhood of God Uh, Just extend to you, as he speaks to you, his truth. Romans 8, 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Ernest Hemingway wrote a story that characterized the relationship between a father and a son. The story revolves around a father and his teenage son named Paco, set in Spain. Paco was an extremely common name in Spain at the time. And with ambitions to become a matador and to escape his father's control, Paco ran away to the capital of Spain called Madrid. His father, desperate to reconcile with his son, followed him to Madrid and put an ad in the local newspaper with a simple phrase. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. The next day at noon, in front of the newspaper office, there were 800 men named Paco, (laughs) all seeking forgiveness. The relationship between fathers and their children is often complicated, is it not? But how vitally important it is. We even have a term, we call it the daddy wound or the father wound, and many people live perpetually with such a wound, although I want to encourage you that this passage can really heal that in you. But really there's a bigger issue regarding fatherhood, and that is a greater need than our human father, but we have a greater need for a heavenly father. We all have a need for a heavenly father. You see, we all want a good father, but what we really need is a good heavenly father. And to be in God's family with him as our father is actually what fulfills life's greatest need. I would would postulate to you that our greatest need is that we have a heavenly father. And so a lot of times we talk about we need God, but the idea of God as our father is really the the idea that that encapsulates his relationship to us. What is a father after all? What does it mean? Uh, Ideally, we we know what a lot of fathers do, but what is a father supposed to do? Well, a father is primarily supposed to look after their child. They are the protectors of their child. They are the ones who will always be looking out. I saw a video the other day of uh, a man who was sitting in the park on his phone, and these people with a camera decided they were going to go ahead and um, try to... uh, take the child and see if the child would go with them and kidnap this child. I don't know how they got away with this, but to offer the kid candy to see if they would go with him to see what the dad would do. And this man walks over to him and says, and you can see he's offering him candy and he says, and then come on. And then the little kid grabs his hand and starts walking away. 
and the man never noticed. Then he looks up, he sees his son is gone, he starts looking around, and uh, these, uh, these people then bring the kid back and go, hey, shame on you for being so preoccupied that you missed your fatherly duty, which is to protect your child in this dangerous environment. A good father does that. A good father is always aware of what's going on with his kids, and he's protecting them. He actually will protect them when no one else will. Uh, he's supposed to help his children develop and grow and provide for their flourishing. He's supposed to provide an environment not only of safety, but of flourishing, where, where they can become who they're supposed to be. He's the one who's supposed to show them what it means to move from the child world to the adult world and how to live in that world with dignity and honor. He teaches them how to do that. He's supposed to provide a stable and secure environment in the home for his kids. He can either provide instability or stability. It's really up to the dad to provide those things. It's a fatherly thing. And so he's supposed to ha provide a protective environment where the kids feel safe. He tells his kids who they are, and they need to know that he loves them. And when a child knows that their father loves them and he tells them who they are, then you'll see some of the most self-secure human beings on the planet. And so when you have a heavenly father who does these things for you, then you become one of the most secure people on the planet. Listen to a verse like this. This is just one of the many verses that talks about the fatherhood of God. Psalm 68, 5. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Isn't that just salve to the soul? He is the father to the fatherless. It doesn't matter if you have a father. It doesn't matter if you have a good father or a bad father. Your heavenly father is a father to you. Now, the truth that it says here in this passage that we are sons of God is vital to understanding our relationship to God. Now, we need to understand that by Paul using the phrase son of God, it's a metaphor. Now, we are, we are sons of God, but he wants to give us the metaphor of a humanly idea of what it means to be the son of a father. Now, I want to tell you this, that some people want to exclude the concept that all Christians are sons of God. Notice it didn't say here, sons and daughters. It says, sons of God. And so some people think that this was an error, and that our modern day times um, cause us to want to say sons or daughter. And for example, the um, NIV from 1984, the New International Version, translate verse 14 and says that we are sons of God. But in the new version, the 2011 version, the NIV says children of God. So they actually changed sons of God to children of God because they felt like uh, we shouldn't be talking about sons only. We should be talking about sons and daughters. They don't believe that Paul could actually be calling both men and women sons of God. But I'm going to postulate to you that's exactly Paul's intention. Paul is telling us here metaphorically that men and women are sons of God. And that it actually needs to be in our translations. Because Paul went to great extents to do this against his own culture. To equalize men and women as sons of God was extremely controversial for Paul to do. And would put him up to major scrutiny amongst his own people. Because men and women were not treated the same in families. But in God's family, they are all treated the same as sons of God. And I'll, I'll prove this to you both linguistically and metaphorically. So first, linguistically. There are two words in the Greek that Paul could have used. One is weos, which is son, and one is technon, which is child. Notice here that he actually uses both Greek words. In verses 14 and 15, he says, uh, weos. So in verse 14, he says, uh, we are sons of God, weos of God, of theos. And then verse 15, he again says that we have re received the adoption as sons, as weos. But then in verses 16 and 17, he uses a different word, technon, when he says that we are the children of God. And in verse 17, and if children, that's technos, technon. So he specifically used two different words. He could have used technon the whole time to say children, but he doesn't. The first few verses, he wants to tell us that we all are sons of God, and that that has a specific meaning. Second is that Paul's using this metaphor because of the culture. 
Because, because what comes along with being a son is what both men and women in Christ need to know. You see, in Middle Eastern culture, a son had different rights than a daughter. A son became mature, and then he received the family's privileges and participation in the family life and business. And usually, um, a young lady did not have those same rights. Theologian D.R. Carson sheds light on this, and he says, in our culture, relatively few sons end up doing what their fathers did. You remember, you used to see those, you know, those signs that say, something in sons. But if I were to ask how many of you men you do what your fathers did, probably on average, less than 5% of you do what your fathers did. But in the ancient world, in the Middle East, it would be reversed. Over 90% of all men in that culture did what their fathers did. Now, now think about that for a moment. They didn't go to college. They didn't go to high school. They went to dad's school. Their father taught them everything they needed to know in life, including how to make a living. If your father was a farmer, you became a father, and as a child, you would farm with him, and all your life, he would teach you how to farm. If you, your father was a baker, then he would be bringing you along, waking you up early in the morning. You would help make, make the bread, knead the dough, and you would bake bread. You usually didn't have choices about your vocation because your dad determined your vocation. Your dad determined your identity in all of your life. If he was a violin maker... You would make violins. If, if he uh, was going to teach you how to make violins, he would show you what woods to choose, what sizes and ratios each piece had to maintain, what glues to use, where and how, and, and how to apply the finish. And possibly he even taught you how to play that violin. We see a great example of this in Jesus. Jesus is often called the son of a carpenter. But then, uh, amazingly, in Mark 6, 3, it says, is not this the carpenter? So Jesus was both called the son of a carpenter and a carpenter because he was the son of a carpenter. So ju fathers generated you not only biologically as men, but also functionally. He established a son's vocation, his place in the culture, his identity, and his place in the family. For instance, he decided uh, how a firstborn would lead the family. So, so a father determined all of these things for a son's life that he didn't particularly for his daughters. So by Paul saying that we are all sons of God, he's ascribing that place that a son had in his family to both men and women. And he's elevating women to the point of saying, you are treated just like the sons of a family. You are given your identity, your purpose, and your place in the family by your father, God. And the result is that as part of the family of God, then our lives reflect sonship. So we have to get this concept uh, out of our mind of sons being, uh, you know, just for males only and say our lives as Christians, men and women, should reflect sonship. We should want to be called sons of God. We should want to live in a way of sonship. But as we get into this text, I want to say that not every one of us embraces our sonship. Not every one of us embraces God determining who we are, God determining what we do, and God determining our place in his family. As a matter of fact, some of us are self-designated black sheep in the family. We've decided to live on the fringes, both with the father and with our brothers and sisters. We're uncomfortable with the Father and his intimacy that he wants with us, and we're uncomfortable with the, with the brothers and sisters of Christ and intimacy with them. We have purposely marginalized ourselves, and many of us have probably been there a time or two. So th this should be incredibly encouraging to you, if you've ever felt this way, that this passage is for all of us to understand who we have in God as our Father. And so the main point of this passage is this. As sons of God, we should live like sons of God. As sons of God, we should live like sons of God. And there are three ways that the sons of God live. One is sons of God don't live for sin, but they live by the Spirit. Secondly, sons of God don't live in fear, they live in confidence. And thirdly, sons of God don't live in ease, but they do live for a future.
And that, that's really where Paul's getting here today. So let's take a look at the first way a son is to live. Sons of God don't live for sin, but they live by the Spirit. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Now, Paul is very intentional here in calling them brothers because he's uh, immediately establishing a familial relationship. And what's fascinating is he doesn't even know most of these people. But he knows that they're brothers because if they're sons of God, then they're brothers. Because if you're a son of God and somebody else is a son of God, then you're all brothers. And we're, it's fine to say brothers and sisters. But, but we're, we're all related in the family of God. So he, he says, so then brothers, we are debtors. Stop. We are debtors. This means that you and I, if we're debtors, we're obligated to some duty. He hasn't explained what that is, but apparently we owe something to someone. And, and, and it seems obvious that the debt we owe is to God, but why? Why do we owe a debt? Well, we can say pretty easily this is probably talking about a spiritual debt, not a physical debt. And if we know the Scriptures, we know this, that 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that we are not our own, that we have been bought with a price. The price of Jesus Christ's own blood, which we're going to celebrate here in communion. So when we celebrate communion, we celebrate the fact that we are now bought with a price. We are now God's people and that we have been brought into this relationship and that the, the, in a sense we owe a debt. But we need to understand that a huge portion of that debt is owed to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus paid the price, but the Holy Spirit applies it. Listen to what the Holy Spirit has done for us. First, he first when we first got convicted of our need for Christ, he's the one who convicted us. John 16, 8. And when he comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. He's the convictor. If you've been convicted in your life, it's him. You owe that to the Holy Spirit, that he does that for you. Then when you were convicted, he revealed Christ to you. 1 Corinthians 2.10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So, so now we know that, 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 Christ, that the Spirit reveals who Christ is to us. And then thirdly, he gives us eternal life. It's the Spirit who gives us eternal life. As Jesus said in John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And we know that Jesus later in John talks about that the water is the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives us life, which we talked about last week. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit seals us. Once we are then saved and receive eternal life, Ephesians 1, 13 says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He seals you for eternity. No one will break that seal. You are guaranteed eternal life. And it's the Holy Spirit who maintains you all of your days. So, in a sense, we owe a debt to the Holy Spirit because he convicted us, he called us, he gave us eternal life, and he seals us. So we are debtors, brothers and sisters. We are debtors not to live to the flesh, but live according to the Spirit. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The consequence of this debt and work by the Holy Spirit is that we're not obligated to the, to the sin nature anymore. We're obligated to the Spirit those who claim to be saved but live for sin, it says your end is death. It only leads to death. Now, a lot of us will uh, um, uh, immediately begin to worry and say, does this mean that I'll lose my salvation if I sin? That's actually not Paul's point here. His point here is this. He's talking about habitual living. If you're habitually living for sin, it only lives in death. If you're habitually living by the Spirit, it's going to lead to life. We talked about that a little bit la last week. But we need to understand this, that as those who are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, that the more sin that we let enter our lives, the more death we will bring in, bit by bit. John Owens, in his book, The Mortification of Sin, which is one of my top three books that every Christian should read, uh, but get the abridged, easy-to-read version. Old English is pretty rough. He said famously this, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. 
So if you're not killing sin, if you're not fighting against it, it will bring death into your life. What does it mean to bring death into your life? It means simply this. It will put death to your holiness. It will put death to your walk with Christ. It will bring death to living in joy and happiness in Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? The more sin we have, the more it kills the goodness in our lives. The word here is mortification in verse 13. It says, but if, by the, you, but if by the Spirit, so if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is a command of something you must do. You must put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. To put to death is to mortify. It's called, in Christianese, this is mortification. That's why the book is called The Mortification of Sin. That means that we have to put our own Sith to death but we must do it by the means of the Holy Spirit. Though God saves us, we need to understand this. Though God saves us, this does not mean we are automatically sanctified. What it means is that every single sin, now that we're walking with Christ, every single sin in our lives has to be rooted out one by one. Systematically and individually. Tell me an amen if this is true. One of the plagues of Idaho is puncture vine. Oh, that wasn't very loud. Puncture vine is, is the bane of our existence here, right? When spring came around and I started cleaning out my garage, I realized that like, I have like seven bikes in my garage. No shocker, right? Every single one of them was flat. Every single one of them had flat tires from puncture vine. And I'm sitting there, and I'm putting the green goo in it, and I'm putting liners in it, and I'm buying new ones, and I'm practically funding Walmart by my tire purchases. And, uh, and it's all because of puncture vine. I don't even know where we get this stuff. We don't ride out in the fields. We ride on streets filled with puncture vine. But last summer in my yard, I began to look around, and I realized popping up in the middle of my backyard was tons of puncture vine in my own yard. And I've talked to some people, so I know some of you are going to talk to me after this and tell me I'm wrong, but as far as I know, you can't use, like, chemicals to kill this stuff. It's hardy, hardy stuff. And what I was told was, you have to actually get down and just pull it out one by one. Just get that stuff out of there. So I'm like, I do not want this in my yard. So I grabbed a screwdriver, and I just went down there, and I just started pulling each one of those things. Just stick that screwdriver in and pulling each one out. I used a tool, and I was able to get it out. And we know that if usually you don't use some sort of tool that the the root will stay there, and then it'll pop back up, right? Well, in this case, the Holy Spirit is the tool to get at the root of sin. And you got to use it to mortify and to put to death every individual sin that pops up in your yard, in your life. you got to constantly go after it. you got to root it out. We are here commanded to put to death the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit. And, and there's a passage in Colossians that tells us what specific spirits, or excuse me, um, things we're supposed to put to death. And that's in Colossians 3, 5. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. So that's pretty broad, right? All of the earthly desires, everything that the world wants, put to death in you. For example, sexual immorality. That means lusting and desiring someone you're not married to. Impurity, that means even deeper, which would include pornography and, and visual images and watching things with desire based on TV shows and movies. Passion, this is, this is desires inside of you that no one else can see for things that are sinful. Again, evil desire, things, a desire to do something that goes against God and the Holy Spirit. Covetousness, which is also not seen and not visible. It's that inner desire to have the things that other people have because you're not satisfied with what you have. As a matter of fact, he even calls it idolatry, doesn't he? That's actually a false god is saying, I want a bigger house. That's idolatry. I want a bigger car. I want that car like the neighbor I have has. That's a false religion. And, and what he's saying is, is we need to root out and kill all of those sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you're beginning to live like a son of God at that point. So we get to verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit 
are of God, are sons of God. So if we're, if we're walking by the Spirit, we are sons of God. If we're, if we're killing these things and we're following what the Spirit is leading us to do, then we are acting like sons of God. What he's saying here is this. All true sons of God have one undeniable fact about them that everyone should be able to see, that you are led by the Holy Spirit. When someone looks at a son of God's life, they should be able to say, that guy, that lady, is led by the Spirit of God. They do not follow the world's passions. They do not follow their own sinful desires. They follow God's lead, which is evidenced by the leading of the Holy Spirit. This does not only mean that they are indwelt by the Spirit. We're not only indwelt, but as sons of God, we're actually supposed to be um, submissive to and allowing ourselves to be led by the Spirit. And the opposite is true. If someone is not led by the Spirit, follow me here, if someone is not led by the Spirit, then they are not what? A son of God. This language pictures a shepherd-sheep relationship. If you have a shepherd, you will follow him right? You are led by the Spirit. So the Spirit is pictured here as a shepherd, and we as sheep will follow. If we don't follow the shepherd, we're probably not part of his flock. This type of relationship should characterize our walk with God. Wherever the shepherd leads, the Spirit, we will follow. Because if you're a son of God, then you're going to identify with your father. Remember, when you grow up as a, as a violin maker, you make violins. That's what you do. And so in the spiritual realm, if you're a son of God, you walk by the Spirit. You do what He wants you to do. You live a life that, that reflects Him, which essentially reflects Christ. You listen to Him. What He says you should do, you do. Who He says you are, you are. You obey what He tells you. You're part of His family. You join in on the things He wants you to be a part of. He combines you with a group of people. You worship with them because you're a son of God. You live according to the purposes He has designed for you before you were ever born because your father had been thinking about you before you were ever, bo ever born and He had plans for you to live a certain way. And so those who are sons of God live according to that way. My children, um, when they're around other people, are sometimes instructed by others to do things. Sometimes in my presence, another adult will tell my kids something to do. And if I'm there in, 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 in their presence, a funny thing will happen. If an adult tells one of my kids what to do, they'll often look at me to see what my eyes will do. And if I, if I give them a nod and go, they know that means it's okay to obey that adult because they look to their father to give them guidance on what they should and should not do. Right? Because that's how we react to fathers. We don't react to other adults that way. We react to fathers this way as if to say, is this okay, dad? Is this okay for me to do this? That is what it means to be led by the Spirit. Is it okay, dad? that I go and watch that movie? Is it okay, Dad, that I go and I do this? Is it okay that I'm thinking of this? What do you want me to do? So in simple terms, we get this, right? If our dad says to do it, we do it. If he says not to do it, we don't do it. And how do we know these things? The Spirit illuminates the Scriptures. The, script, the Spirit teaches us the ways of the Scriptures so that we can do it. Sinclair Ferguson an amazing theologian said this about sonship. Our sonship to God is the apex of all creation and the goal of all redemption. The whole point of all of this, brothers and sisters, is that you would live as a son of God. That's actually the point of it all, to make you a family, to bring you into the family of God where you have a father-son relationship with the heavenly father. God wanted a family that would be one for eternity, and that his kids would live according to his values now and live according to them there. And those kids will be open to follow the Holy Spirit, which he so lovingly gave all of us to give us a guide. He has not left us as orphans. In John, he says that. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you my spirit. And so his spirit is constantly leading us away from sin into walking with the spirit. Secondly, Sons of God don't live in fear, but in confidence. 
Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. What is the spirit of slavery? We need to identify that. This is a pretty amazing thing. The spirit of slavery is a mentality that somebody who was freed from slavery might have. You see, one potential way that a a freed slave might begin to live is in fear. Let, let Let me try to help you out here. A lot of times when we're freed from slavery to something bad, there's a fear of losing what made us secure through our old master and a fear of how our new master will treat us. Let's use an example. Let's say getting over drug addiction. It, 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 you're, when you're in drug addiction, you're under a harsh master. And if that addiction has been part of your life for a long time, it has become to identify you to the point where when you're not doing it, you don't really know what to do or who you are. It has control over you and determines your actions and determines your identity. So when somebody gets freed from that addiction, they're oftentimes free from it but they don't know where their security comes from and their identity, and they become to live in fear of what do I do now, right? And so when they get into situations where um, they're now free from that addiction, they're not sure what to replace it with, and so they can begin to live in a fear of what do I do now? What's my identity? This is like a smoker who stops smoking who every time he gets in a nervous situation is, I don't know what to do with my hands, or as somebody who's getting over, alco- you know, being an alcoholic who gets into a stressful situation and goes, I need a drink. That's a spirit of fear where you want to go back. And he says this, you have been set free from sin, but you have not been given a spirit of fear. He gives you a new thing to do, a new identity, a, a new father who's going to care for you, and he's going to be good to you. So when people become Christians... Oftentimes they fear living for the Lord. And and how do I do this? And sometimes people, again, they make themselves black sheep and go, I I don't know how to live this life, this Christian life, because perhaps I'm not good enough. Perhaps I don't know what to do. But this is the good news, brothers and sisters. The Father says, I have a plan for you now that you're free from your sin. I am your Father, and this is what I want you to do. And it will fill that fear. It will, it will take that fear away from you and give you a purpose and a future that will make you have peace. And, and how does he do this? We did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Let's talk about that because, boy, that's good news. Notice here that when it says in your ESV, spirit of fear, uh, spirit of slavery to fear, it's a lowercase s, spirit. But in the, when it talks about a spirit of adoption, it uses the uppercase s as in the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of fear is our own spirit, but then he gives you the spirit, the Holy Spirit, as a spirit of adoption. And so what he's saying here is this. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit enters you and makes you an adopted child. And this is the second metaphor. First metaphor, sons of God. Second metaphor is you are an adopted kid. You are adopted. Now, we need to understand a little bit of background here. First, an adoption requires a record from the court of law. The paper receives a stamp, a seal, and a signature verifying its authenticity and validating the adoptee's legal rights over that child from that day forward. So that piece of paper with a seal on it says, adopted officially, right, by the state of Idaho, and it's legal in every way that this adoption has taken place. But what's the Holy Spirit? Our seal. The Holy Spirit is the seal in you that says you are God's child. You are God's son. The Holy Spirit is a, is a seal. It's officially making you adopted. When he comes into your life and he enters into you, you are officially adopted. Now let's understand something about adoption because adoption is amazing. We weren't born children of God, right? We became sons of God by faith through grace as we are justified in Christ so this is very pictured in the Roman and Greek culture 
who adopted sons. In the Roman and Greek culture, when they adopted a son, they shared the same privileges as natural born sons. We need to know that they had, this is a very legal thing that was going on. When, when a Roman adopted someone, all of their former ties of their family were, were cut off. They were actually not considered part of that family anymore. They took on a totally new family. And the adopted child entered into this new family and took a new identity, including the new family's name. And with that name came all of the stuff that went along with who that family was. The adopted child's life would radically change, and he would start living like a new person according to the lifestyle of his new family. This is well pictured in the book Ben-Hur. In Ben-Hur, it's a tale of a man by that name. He was a Jew living in Jerusalem under Roman occupation. Early in the story, a roof tile accidentally falls and nearly kills a Roman. And to spare a friend who accidentally knocked the tile off, Ben-Hur uh, takes the blame for it. His property is seized, and he becomes a slave of the Roman Empire. So he's considered a murderer. He is sentenced to row on a galley ship for the rest of his life, which presumably will be very short. Instead, something unexpected happens. Ben-Hur ends up saving the life of the ship captain, who is a very influential Roman. They become good friends, and eventually, the Roman sees Ben-Hur as his son and formally adopts him. Ben-Hur receives a new Roman name, and he becomes the heir to the property and money, and he receives all the power and prestige of his new adopted father. You see, adoption during the time of Paul was so total and complete that if a slave was adopted by a Roman citizen, not only did they cease to be a slave, but they ceased to be the person they once were. The old identity, the old person, the old name, the old family is gone. It's all new. So much so that Ben-Hur can return to Jerusalem and walk in the streets and everyone knows who he is and no one can do anything about it because Ben-Hur, the criminal, no longer exists. All due to his adoption because he's a completely new man. That's what adoption is that Paul's talking about here. As you're sealed by the Spirit, you get a new name, you get a new identity, you get a new inheritance, you get a new family, and you get a new future in Christ. Amen? Listen to what Galatians 4, 6 through 7 says about the change from slavery to sonship. It says, and because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. No longer slave, son. This is why when we talked about us being slaves to God, we had to add sonship to it. We must hold both. We are slave to righteousness and sons of God. Both are true. And this adoption is so complete that we can actually call God Abba, Father. This is the way of referring to a father in an intimate way. Even today in the Middle East, you'll go around and you'll hear, Abba, 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 as little children run around and, and call out for their dads. And this ability, it says, is only given to us by the Holy Spirit. Only the presence of the Holy Spirit in you can get you to say, Abba, Father, to call out to the Father in an intimate way as your Father. It is how you know he is at work in you. What's interesting is Jesus once said that the sheep will know the shepherd's voice and follow him, but this passage reverses that and also says that the Father knows our voice when we call him. That, that he, is, he is our Abba, and he looks at us and says, yes, child, I am your Abba. And then we get to verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Only the Holy Spirit who indwells us upon belief and gives us this new disposition towards God can confirm the reality of our salvation. The only way, brothers and sisters, you can know that he is your Abba Father, that you can know that he is your Heavenly Father is by the Holy Spirit's work in you, confirming it. That means that, that you, if you believe you're saved, have to have that qualified by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to say, yes, you are the child of God because I am in you. If you do not know if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you need to start asking some hard questions. You either are or you are not. And all those who are sons of God are, and all those who are not sons of God are not. Brothers and sisters, we should never take the role of the Holy Spirit. We should never guarantee anybody saved. 
If somebody comes to you and says, I'm not sure if you're saved, we do not have the right to tell them that they are. Even if it's your child, the Holy Spirit must confirm this in them. And that is the only biblical way that people can be fully assured of their salvation. But once you have that, you will never question it again, will you? Because nothing can question that. You may question some of the things you did and say, well, I did these things, but I'm not sure if they were really from God. But you'll never say that about the Holy Spirit. If you know the Holy Spirit's in you, then you have 100% guarantee that you are saved. There's once a 12-year-old boy who was saved at a revival. Later, his friends questioned him about it. One said, did you see a vision? Another said, did you hear God speak? The boy answered all of these questions with a simple no. Well, then how did you know you were saved? The boy replied, it's like when you catch a fish. You can't see the fish or hear the fish. You just feel him tugging on your line. I just felt God tugging on my heart. You know when the Holy Spirit is working in you. So I ask you, are you on Abba terms with God? Are you on Abba terms with God? Is he not just God, but is he daddy? Daddy. Do you have that relationship with him? Is he that close? Do you realize he wants to be that intimate with you? That he is close to you? This should change our perspective, shouldn't it? So many times we're cold with God. But a child should not be cold with their father, and neither should we be with Abba. Abba, Father. Do you know Jesus said Abba, Father, quite a bit when he prayed? And so should we. Do you believe that he really loves you that much? Well, the sons of God don't live for sin but by the Spirit. And the sons of God don't live in fear, but they live in confidence of Abba Father. And lastly, the sons of God don't live in ease but for the future. Verse 17, And of children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Here's the thing. Being a son of God, it's not easy. It's not easy to be a son of God. He talks about, uh, we'll get these things provided we suffer with him. We'll get an inheritance provided we suffer with him. Now, that's not saying that it's contingent. It's that this is a, this is a, ne- a necessi- necessary contingency in the Greek. It means, be, he says, because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, you will suffer, and those who will suffer will receive glory. The cross must come before the crown. So being a son of God in this life is not easy. We want to live for Christ in in the face of opposition, specifically because we're a Christian. Because the world hated the Spirit in Christ, the world will hate the Spirit in us. So when you show yourself as those led by the Spirit, you will be hated and you will be despised, but you will be seen as God's son. And, and he tells us then, it's not easy, but you are promised future glory. So when you're struggling to be a son of God now, remember that you have future glory with him. You have a future of inheritance. This is fascinating. It says, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Why does it say that? We are heirs, so now we are adopted children who receive the inheritance And we are heirs of God, so he's our father, and fellow heirs with Christ. Well, here's the thing. This is what it means. The father only has one natural-born son who's not adopted, Jesus. And the father promised his son Jesus the inheritance. Jesus is the heir of all things. Hebrews 1, 2, listen to this. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And he is also the inheritor of all creation. What does he inherit? Psalm 2, 6 through 8. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. He's talking about Jesus. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So Jesus is the heir of the universe. And what this verse is saying is that the Father is giving us, 
an inheritance in all things, and we are co-heirs with his son, Jesus Christ. So in that sense, what he's saying about the family is, metaphorically speaking, Jesus is our brother, and we are inheriting what he inherits equally. That's what that means. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, or co-heirs. Again, we go back to the Roman um, world. In the Roman world, an adopted son gets the same in level of inheritance as the natural born ones. So whatever Christ inherits, you inherit as a fellow heir with your brother Christ. Where else does it talk about Jesus being our brother? Take a look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of Christ. Remember, these are metaphors, but we got to understand that, that it's important that Jesus be our brother in the sense because we are co-heirs. And what do we inherit? We inherit glory. And what is glory? This world, this universe, and our new bodies. This is the glory to come. The inheritance of the future of the new kingdom in Christ is inherited by us because we know Christ and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. The father loves his kids. He wants them to be at his home. He wants them to live with him forever. And his home is going to eventually be this entire universe. Run by him, guided by him, and you inherit it all. So I, I close with this this morning, brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts for communion. Do you live according to the Spirit in such a way that you know the father well? That, that you relate to the Father as Abba, that you know what you have in him, that you don't live perpetually uh, distant and away, but that you draw near into the Father's arms and you want to remain close to him. You want to be in that intimate relationship because that's what he calls us to. And how do we get there? If you're not there, how do we get there? It's the Spirit who guides you. The Spirit, if you, if you submit to him and you are led by him, then he will lead you through your prayer time and your walk with him and your meditation on the word of God into a close relationship with the Father who says to you constantly as you're reading his word, I love you, you're my child, and you're going to be with me forever. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Abba, Father, we love you. You love us. You have made us sons. You have adopted us. You have given us an inheritance. May your name be praised forever. May we glorify your name as we sing and as we take communion. And may our lives reflect our sonship. May we live as sons of God for all the world to see. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you all stand with us? This adoption that Pastor Brett was just referring to was made possible through the precious blood of Jesus. And so that's what we'll sing about now.
Please have a seat. Thank you. Amen. God is good. Boy, and communion is a special time. Uh, I, my wife and I have been part of this church for about 40, well, 43, 44 years. We got married right on this stage in 1981, and um, we love this church. Um, I, my wife, we were both raised in Yakima, Washington, Yakima Valley, and um, I was raised in uh, Grandview, Grace Brethren Church of Grandview, and um, our pastor did the communion service a little bit different. He at least he used different words uh, when he, we were doing the cup, he said, the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ, and the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Now, I, you know, as a child, you know, we don't understand everything, and, and I always thought it was kind of strange that a, a cup that symbolized blood would be called the cup of blessing. You know, it just, like, why is it a blessing? And um, uh, later on, I, I understood there were really good reasons for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the Last Supper, when, when Jesus was celebrating the, the Passover with the disciples, which uh, a couple of weeks ago was the Jewish Passover, and they were doing the Seder services. And, uh, well, it was that night that Jesus instituted the the ordinance of the communion that uh, commemorates uh, Christ's sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. And uh, uh, so the name of that meal is the Seder service because each part of that meal it has a very important meaning. And um, I'm not going to take the time to talk about this, right? All the meanings, because I don't even think I could. But I do know that uh, certain parts, there was actually four cups that were served during that meal. And, and each cup had a, uh, a special meaning and, uh, and uh, had a special name that, uh, that was referred to a, a Bible verse that, uh, that gives us some promises. And I'll just read that to you, Exodus chapter 6, verses six through eight. Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of, Egypt, of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you out from their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stre outstretched arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to be my people, and I will uh, be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land concerning uh, the which I did swear to give it to a Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. And uh, from those verses, um, they, they have those, the four cups. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification. It goes with the phrase, I will bring you out from the burden of the Egyptians. The second cup is the cup of deliverance, uh, which goes with, I will deliver you from, bond, from their bondage. The third cup is the cup of redemption or the cup of blessing, which goes with, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And the fourth cup is I is the cup of restoration or the cup of praise, which goes with the phrase, I will take you for, to be my people, and I will be your God. Um, you know, I, it was when that Jesus took that third cup that during that evening that he, that he actually inaugurated the, uh, the new covenant. He inaugurated uh, our... Uh, uh, and the, started the, the first communion service. And uh, so that was the cup of redemption. And, um, and 
So, um, the meaning of that cup of blessing is, uh, is pretty profound if we think about it because it's, it's, it's what Jesus did for us on the cross and the changes that that, uh, that made for us. See, it, for the Israelites, they were in, they were in bondage. They were, they were slaves, kind of like, like Pastor Barrett was talking about. Uh, you know, before we're saved, we are slaves. We're slaves to sins. And we're slaves to a, a lot of things that are destroying our lives. And uh, God understood that, that pain of slavery. God heard their cries for help, and God sent a Messiah. And for them, he sent uh, Moses to uh, deliver them. Uh, but today, he hears our cries, too. And I, I'm assuming that most of us in this room are Christians. I'm assuming that most of us in this room have been delivered from our uh, slavery to sin. And that, uh, that we have a lot to rejoice in the Lord for. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate today. You know, another thing that I had a hard time with uh, it is like, am I supposed to be sad during communion service? Am I supposed to have a sad face? Um, you know, uh, when I was a kid and with my, my brother, when I was, um, we, in, our, in our communion service, we had, we had a little bit extra too. We had uh, the bread and the cup. but We also had a foot washing service. It's a brethren church. And we also had a, an agape meal. So it was a little bit longer, so we actually had an entire evening for the communion service. And, um, and so kids couldn't really go to it unless they really understood what it was all about and uh, could you know, t take it seriously. And so I remember when I was about 10 years old and asking my, my dad, can we be part of the communion service? And uh, he didn't know if we were ready, but after thinking about it, he said, okay, if you guys can be, you know, behave, you know, and, and don't laugh, you know. And, you know, he had to say that, I guess, because, you know, my brother and I were sitting next to each other, and we were just sitting there thinking, okay, we're not going to laugh, and we're not going to laugh, you know. And for some reason, the more we sat there, and the more we thought that we weren't going to laugh, the more it just started building up, you know. And, and you know, you, you all know that I'm, I'm a good boy. I mean, I'm, I'm a good kid, right? You all know that, okay? Well, you know, so we're sitting there, and I could see my brother kind of go, and before long, all of a sudden, he was laughing out loud, you know, and it was like, it was terrible, you know. I mean, it was a distraction, and so my, my dad took us both out of the room, you know. It was embarrassing, and, um, but, um, you know, uh, communion doesn't have to be a sad time. Um, sure, we are thinking about something really terrible, when Jesus Christ took all the sins of the world on him, he shed his blood for us. And sure, we, we can be thinking, he died for my sins on that cross. He died for your sins. And, and, it, and the community service is a good time for us to evaluate right now, where am I? Where am I? Do I have sins I need to confess? Do I need to get right with God? Communion is a good time for that. But it's, all, it's also a good time to think about the meaning of our salvation. To think about the, the joys that came because of that redemption, that cup of redemption, you know? It's a, it's a cup of blessing. It's a cup of forgiveness. You know, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So when we take that cup, we can just say, thank you. I can have forgiveness of sins. When we take that cup, we can say, I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. If it wasn't for that cup of blessing, we could not be sons of God today. And all the privileges of joy and joys of being God's son. That that cup represents 
all the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. Freedom from slavery. It resents joys of the future. So as, as we, uh, as we uh, take the cup this morning, I do pray that we, will, I, we can be able to really have their proper balance of being sad. Now, I'm not saying that you should be laughing, okay? Don't get me wrong. But we can be joyful. And we can be happy in it. So let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. We, we are sinful, Lord. We, we need you. We need your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins, Lord. We need your forgiveness. And uh, I just thank you for everything that Christ's death on the cross means to us. And I just pray that we would just be blessed today as we take this communion. In Jesus' name. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after having given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this is... This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Dear Jesus, we, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. 
Thank you for uh, the privilege of becoming your child. And Lord, I just thank you for the, for the newness of our relationship with you and that we can walk in newness of life. And, uh, and Lord, we just give us strength this week to please you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with us as we close our time of worship together by singing the doxology? Thank you all for coming. You are now dismissed. Uh, please stick around for Sunday school and uh, and more and more Sunday fellowship with each other. Bless you all and uh, bless you as you go out and be a blessing to to the world out there. That's where that's where evangelism is done is out there. So be a blessing.